Chapter 23 Kihar Human beings say, it never rains, but it pours. This is not very apt, for it frequently does rain without pouring. The rabbit's proverb is better expressed. They say, one cloud feels lonely. And indeed it is true that the appearance of a single cloud often means that the sky will soon be overcast. However that may be, the very next day provided a dramatic second opportunity to put Hazel's idea into practice. It was early morning, and the rabbits were beginning to silflay, coming up into clear grey silence. The air was still chilly. There was a good deal of dew and no wind. Five or six wild duck flew overhead in a swiftly moving V, intent on some far-off destination. The sound made by their wings came down distinctly, diminishing as they went away southward. The silence returned. With the melting of the last of the twilight there grew a kind of expectancy and tension, as though it were thawing snow about to slide from a sloping roof. Then the whole down, and all below it, earth and air, gave way to the sunrise. As a bull, with a slight but irresistible movement, tosses its head from the grasp of a man who is leaning over the stool and idly holding its horn, so the sun entered the world in smooth, gigantic power. Nothing interrupted or obscured its coming. Without a sound, the leaves shone and the grass coruscated along the miles of the escarpment. Outside the wood, Bigwig and Silver combed their ears, sniffed the air and hopped away following their own long shadows to the grass of the gallop. As they moved over the short turf, nibbling, sitting up and looking round themselves, they approached a little hollow, no more than three feet across. Before they reached the edge, Bigwig, who was ahead of Silver, checked and crouched, staring. Although he could not see into the hollow, he knew that there was some creature in it, something fairly big. Peering through the blades of grass around his head, he could see the curve of a white back. Whatever the creature was, it was nearly as big as himself. He waited, stock still, for some little time, but it did not move. What has a white back, Silver? whispered Bigwig. Silver considered. A cat? No cats here. How do you know? At that moment they both heard a low, breathy hissing from the hollow. It lasted for a few moments, then there was silence once more. Bigwig and Silver had a good opinion of themselves. Apart from Holly, they were the only survivors of the Sandalford Ausler, and they knew that their comrades looked up to them. The encounter with the rats in the barn had been no joke and had proved their worth. Bigwig, who was generous and honest, had never for a moment resented Hazel's courage on the night when his own superstitious fear had got the better of him. But the idea of going back to the honeycomb and reporting that he had glimpsed an unknown creature in the grass and left it alone was more than he could swallow. He turned his head and looked at Silver. Seeing that he was game, he took a final look at the strange white back and then went straight up to the edge of the hollow. Silver followed. It was no cat. The creature in the hollow was a bird, a big bird, nearly a foot long. Neither of them had ever seen a bird like it before. The white part of its back which they had glimpsed through the grass was in fact only the shoulders and neck. The lower back was light grey and so were the wings, which tapered to long black-tipped primaries folded together over the tail. The head was very dark brown, almost black, in such sharp contrast to the white neck that the bird looked as though it were wearing a kind of hood. The one dark red leg they could see ended in a webbed foot and three powerful taloned toes. The beak, hooked slightly downward at the end, was strong and sharp. As they stared, it opened, disclosing a red mouth and throat. The bird hissed savagely and tried to strike, but still it did not move. "'It's hurt,' said Bigwig. 
Yes, you can tell that, replied Silver. But it's not wounded anywhere that I can see. I'll go round. Look out, said Bigwig. He'll have you. Silver, as he started to move around the hollow, had come closer to the bird's head. He jumped back just in time to avoid a quick darting blow of the beak. That would have broken your foot, said Bigwig. As they squatted, looking at the bird, for they both sensed intuitively that it would not rise, it suddenly burst into a loud, raucous cry. Yuck! 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 A tremendous sound at close quarters that split the morning and carried far across the down. Bigwig and Silver turned and ran. They collected themselves sufficiently to pull up short of the wood and make a more dignified approach to the bank. Hazel came to meet them in the grass. There was no mistaking their wide eyes and dilated nostrils. Elil, asked Hazel. Well, I'm blessed if I know to tell you the truth, replied Bigwig. There's a great bird out there like nothing I've ever seen. How big? As big as a pheasant? Not quite so big, admitted Bigwig, but bigger than a wood pigeon and a lot fiercer. Is that what cried? Yes, it startled me, all right. We were actually beside it, but for some reason or other it can't move. Dying? I don't think so. I'll go and look at it, said Hazel. It's savage. For goodness sake, be careful. Bigwig and Silver returned with Hazel. The three of them squatted outside the bird's reach as it looked sharply and desperately from one to the other. Hazel spoke in the hedgerow patois. You hurt? You no fly? The answer was a harsh gabbling which they all felt immediately to be exotic. Wherever the bird came from, it was somewhere far away. The accent was strange and guttural, the speech distorted. They could catch only a word here and there. Come keel! You come keel! Click me, finish me, no finish, or you damn plenty! The dark brown head flickered from side to side. Then, unexpectedly, the bird began to drive its beak into the ground. They noticed for the first time that the grass in front of it was torn and scored with lines. For some moments it stabbed here and there, but then gave up lifted its head and watched them again. "'I believe it's starving,' said Hazel. "'We'd better feed it. Big we go and get some worms or something. There's a good fellow.' "'Er, uh, what did you say, Hazel?' "'Worms.' "'Me dig for worms?' "'Didn't the owl slit each?' Oh, "'All right, I'll do it,' said Hazel. "'You and Silver wait here.' After a few moments, however, Bigwig followed Hazel back to the ditch and began to join him in scratching at the dry ground. Worms are not plentiful on the downs, and there'd been no rain for days. After a time, Bigwig looked up. What about beetles, wood lice, something like that? They found some rotten sticks and carried them back. Hazel pushed one forward cautiously. Insects. The bird split the stick three ways in as many seconds, and snapped up the few insects inside. Soon there was a small pile of debris in the hollow, as the rabbits brought anything from which you could get food. Bigwig found some horse dung along the track, dug the worms out of it, overcame his disgust, and carried them one by one. When Hazel praised him, he muttered something about the first time any rabbit's done this and don't tell the blackbirds. At last, long after they'd grown weary, the birds stopped feeding and looked at Hazel. Finish eat, it paused. What for you do? You hurt, said Hazel. The bird looked crafty. No hurt, plenty fight. Stay small time, then go. You stay there, you finish, said Hazel. Bad place, come Humba, come Kestrel. Damn the lot, fight plenty. I bet it would too, said Bigwig looking with admiration at the two-inch beak and thick neck. "'We no want you finish,' said Hazel. "'You stay here, you finish. We help you, maybe.' "'Peace off!' <sighs> "'Come on,' said Hazel immediately to the others. "'Let it alone.' He began to lollop back to the wood. Let it try keeping the kestrels off for a bit. "'What's the idea, Hazel?' said Silver. "'That's a savage brute. You can't make a friend out of that.' 
"'You may be right,' said Hazel. "'For what's the good of a blue tit, of a robin, or a robin to us? "'They don't fly any distance. We need a big bird.' "'But why do you want a bird so particularly?' "'I'll explain later,' said Hazel. "'I'd like Blackberry and Fiver to hear as well. "'But let's go underground now, if you don't want to chew pellets. I do.' During the afternoon, Hazel organised more work on the warren. The honeycomb was as good as finished. Though rabbits are not methodical and are never really certain when anything is finished, and the surrounding burrows and runs were taking shape. Quite early in the evening, however, he made his way once more to the hollow. The bird was still there. It looked weaker and less alert, but snapped feebly as Hazel came up. "'Still here,' said Hazel. "'You fight, Hawk?' "'No fight,' answered the bird. "'No fight, but watch, watch, always watch. He's no good.' "'Hungry?' The bird made no reply. "'Listen,' said Hazel. "'Rabbits not eat birds. Rabbits eat grass. We help you.' "'What for help be?' "'Never mind, we make you safe. Big hole. Food, too.' The bird considered. "'Legs, fine. Wing, no good. E bad. "'Well, walk, then. "'You hurt me, I hurt you like damn.' Hazel turned away. The bird spoke again. "'Is long way?' "'No, not far. Come, then.' He got up with a good deal of difficulty, staggering on its strong, blood-red legs. Then it opened its wings high above its body, and Hazel jumped back, startled by the great arching span but at once it closed them again, grimacing with pain. Ah, ving no good. I come. It followed Hazel docilely enough across the grass, but he was careful to keep out of its reach. Their arrival outside the wood caused something of a sensation, which Hazel cut short with a peremptory sharpness quite unlike his usual manner. Come on, get busy, he said to Dandelion and Buckthorn. This bird's hurt and we're going to shelter it until it's better. Ask Bigwig to show you how to get it some food. It eats worms and insects. Try grasshoppers, spiders, anything. Hawkbit? Acorn? Yes, and you too, Fiver. Come out of that rapt trance, or whatever you're in. We need an open, wide hole, broader than it's deep, with a flat floor a little below the level of the entrance, by nightfall. Oh, we've been digging all the afternoon, Hazel. I know. I'll come and help you, said Hazel. In just a little while. Only get started. The night's coming. The astonished rabbits obeyed him, grumbling. Hazel's authority was put to something of a test, but held firm with the support of Bigwig. Although he had no idea what Hazel had in mind, Bigwig was fascinated by the strength and courage of the bird, and had already accepted the idea of taking it in without troubling himself about the reason. He led the digging, while Hazel explained to the bird, as well as he could, how they lived, their ways of protecting themselves from their enemies, and the kind of shelter they could provide. The amount of food the rabbits produced was not very large, but once inside the wood the bird clearly felt safer and was able to hobble about and do some foraging for itself. By owl time, Bigwig and his helpers had scratched out a kind of lobby inside the entrance to one of the runs leading down from the wood. They lined the floor with beech twigs and leaves. As darkness began to fall, the bird was installed. It was still suspicious but seemed to be in a good deal of pain. Evidently, since it could not think of any better plan for itself, it was ready to try a rabbit hole to save its life. From outside, they could see its dark head alert in the gloom, the black eyes still watchful. It was not asleep when they themselves finished the late sylphle and went underground. Black-headed gulls are gregarious. They live in colonies where they forage and feed, chatter and fight all day long. Solitude and reticence are unnatural to them. They move southward in the breeding season, and at such times a wounded one is, what is too likely to find itself deserted. The gull's savagery and suspicion had been due partly to pain, and partly to the unnerving knowledge that it had no companions and could not fly. By the following morning, its natural instincts to mix with a flock and to talk were beginning to return. Bigwig made himself its companion. He would not hear of the gull going out to forage. Before Nifrith, 
the rabbits had managed to produce as much as it could eat for a time, at all events, and were able to sleep through the heat of the day. Bigwig, however, remained with the gull, making no secret of his admiration, talking and listening to it for several hours. At the evening feed, he joined Hazel and Holly near the bank where Bluebell had told his story of Ella Frera. "'How's the bird now?' asked Hazel. "'A good deal better, I think,' replied Bigwig. "'He's very tough, you know. My goodness, what a life he's had. "'You don't know what you're missing. I could sit and listen to him all day.' "'How has it hurt?' A cat jumped on him in a farmyard. He never heard it until the last moment. It tore the muscle in one of his wings, but apparently he gave it something to remember before he made off. Then he got himself up here somehow or other and just collapsed. Think of standing up to a cat. I can see now that I haven't really started yet. Why shouldn't a rabbit stand up to a cat? Let's just suppose that... But what is this bird? interrupted Holly. Well, I can't quite make it out, answered Bigwig. But if I understand him properly, and I'm not at all sure that I do, he says that where he comes from there are thousands of his kind, more than we can possibly imagine. Their flocks make the whole air white, and in the breezing season their nests are like leaves in a wood, so he says. But where? I've never even seen one, even. He says, said Bigwig, looking very straight at Holly, he says that a long way from here... The earth stops, and there isn't any more. Well, obviously it stops somewhere. What is there beyond? Water. A river, you mean? No, not a river. He says there's a vast place of water going on and on and on. You can't see the other side. There isn't another side. At least there is, because he's been there. Oh, I don't know. I must admit, I can't altogether understand it. Was it telling you that it's been outside the world and come back again? That must be untrue. I don't know, said Bigwig, but I'm sure he's not lying. This water apparently moves all the time and keeps breaking against the earth, and when he can't hear that, he misses it. That's his name. Kiha. It's the noise the water makes. The others were impressed in spite of themselves. Well, why is it here? asked Hazel. He shouldn't be. He ought to have been off to this big water place a long time ago to breed. Apparently a lot of them come away in winter because it gets so cold and wild, then they go back in summer. But he's been hurt once already this spring. It was nothing much, but it held him up. He rested and hung around a rookery for a bit, then he got stronger and left them, and he was coming along when he stopped in the farmyard and met this foul cat. So when it's better it'll go on again, said Hazel. Yes. Well, we've been wasting our time then. Why, Hazel, what is it you have in mind? Go and get Blackberry and Fiver. We'd better have Silver too, then I'll explain. The quiet of the evening sylph lay when the western sun shone straight along the ridge. The grass tussocks threw shadows twice as long as themselves, and the cool air smelled of thyme and dog roses. It was something which they had all come to enjoy, even more than former evenings in the meadows of Sandalford. Although they could not know it, the down was more lonely than it had been for hundreds of years. There were no sheep, and villagers from Kingsclere and Sidmonton no longer had any occasion to walk over the hills, either for business or for pleasure. In the fields of Sandalford, the rabbits had seen men almost every day. Here, since their arrival, they had seen one, and him on a horse. Looking round the little group that gathered on the grass, Hazel saw that all of them, even Holly, were looking stronger, sleeker, and in better shape than when they had first come to the down. Whatever might lie ahead, at least he could feel that he had not failed them so far. We're doing well here, he began, or so it seems to me. We're certainly not a bunch of flesil any more. But all the same, there's something on my mind. I'm surprised, as a matter of fact, that I should be the first one of us to start thinking about it. Unless we can find the answer, then this warren's as good as finished, in spite of all we've done. Why, how can that be, Hazel? said Bigwig. Do you remember Nildrohain? asked Hazel. She stopped running. Poor Strawberry. I know, and we have no does, not one. And no does means no kittens, and in a few years, no warren. It may seem incredible that the rabbits had given no thought to so vital a matter, but men have made the same mistake more than once. 
left the whole business out of account or been content to trust to luck and the fortune of war. Rabbits live close to death, and when death comes closer than usual, thinking about survival leaves little room for anything else. But now, in the evening sunshine on the friendly empty down, with a good burrow at his back and the grass turning to pellets in his belly, Hazel knew that he was lonely for a doe. The others were silent, and he could tell that his words had sunk in. The rabbits grazed or lay basking in the sun. A lark went twittering up into the brighter sunshine above, soared and sang, and came slowly down, ending with a sideways spread wing glide and a wagtail's run through the grass. The sun dipped lower. At last Blackberry said, "'What's to be done? Set out again?' "'I hope not,' said Hazel. "'It all depends. "'What I'd like to do is to get hold of some does and bring them here. "'Where from? Another warren. "'But are there any on these hills? How do we find out? "'The wind never brings the least smell of rabbits.' "'I'll tell you how,' said Hazel. "'The bird. The bird will go and search for us.' "'Hazel, rah!' cried Blackberry. "'What a marvellous idea! "'The bird could find out in a day what we couldn't discover for ourselves in a thousand. Are you certain it can be persuaded to do it? Surely as soon as it gets better it'll simply fly away and leave us. I can't tell, answered Hazel. All we can do is feed it and hope for the best. But, Bigwig, since you seem to be getting along with it so well, perhaps you can explain to it how much this means to us. It only has to fly over the downs and let us know what it sees. You leave him to me, said Bigwig. I think I know how to do it. Hazel's anxiety and the reason for it were soon known to all the rabbits, and there was not one who did not realise what they were up against. There was nothing very startling in what he'd said. He was simply the one, as a chief rabbit ought to be, through whom a strong feeling, latent throughout the warren, had come to the surface. But his plan to make use of the gull excited everyone, and was seen as something that not even Blackberry could have hit upon. Reconnaissance is familiar to all rabbits, indeed it's second nature, but the idea of making use of a bird, and one so strange and savage, convinced them that Hazel, if he could really do it, must be as clever as Elefrera himself. For the next few days, a lot of hard work went into feeding Kihar. Acorn and Pipkin, boasting that they were the best insect catchers in the Warren, brought in great numbers of beetles and grasshoppers. At first, the gull's principal hardship was lack of water. He suffered a good deal, and was reduced to tearing at the stems of the long grasses for moisture. However, during his third night in the warren, it rained for three or four hours and puddles formed on the track. A cluttery spell set in, as it often does in Hampshire when hay time approaches. High winds from the south laid the grass flat all day, turning it to a dull damascene silver. The great branches of the beeches moved little, but spoke loudly. There were squalls of rain on the wind. The weather made Kehar restless. He walked about a good deal, watched the flying clouds and snapped up everything the foragers brought. Searching became harder, for in the wet the insects burrowed into the deep grass and had to be scratched out. One afternoon Hazel, who now shared a burrow with Fiverr as in the old days, was woken by Bigwig to be told that Kehar had something to say to him. He made his way to Kahar's lobby without coming above ground. The first thing that he noticed was the gull's head was molting and turning white, though a dark brown patch remained behind each eye. Hazel greeted him and was surprised to be answered in a few words of halting, broken lapine. Evidently Kahar had prepared a short speech. "'Mr. Hazel, these rabbits work hard,' said Kihar. I no finish now. Soon I go fine. Oh, that's good news, said Hazel. I'm glad. Kahar relapsed into hedgerow vernacular. Mr. Pigvig, he plenty good fella. Yes, he is. He say you no getting mothers. He finish mothers. Plenty trouble for you. Yes, that's true. We don't know what to do. No mothers anywhere. Listen, I get pig, fine plan. I go fine now. Wing is better. Wind finish, then I fly. Fly for you, find plenty mothers. Tell you where they are, yeah? Oh, 
Why, what a splendid idea, Kahar. How clever of you to think of it. You very fine bird. He's finished, mothers, for me this year. He's too late. All mothers sitting on nest now. Eggs come. Oh, I'm sorry. Another time I get mother. Now I fly for you. We'll do everything we possibly can to help you. The next day the wind dropped and Kihar made one or two short flights. However, it was not until three days later that he felt able to set out on his search. It was a perfect June morning. He was snapping up numbers of the little white-shelled downland snails from the wet grass and cracking them in his great beak, when he suddenly turned to Bigwig and said, Now I fly for you. He opened his wings. The two-foot span arched above Bigwig, who sat perfectly still, while the white feathers beat the air around his head in a kind of ceremonious farewell. Laying his ears flat in the fanned draught, he stared up at Kihar as the gull rose, rather heavily, into the air. When he flew, his body, so long and graceful on the ground, took on the appearance of a thick, stumpy cylinder, from the front of which his red beak projected between his round black eyes. For a few moments he hovered, his body rising and falling beneath his wings. Then he began to climb, sailed sideways over the grass, and disappeared northward below the edge of the escarpment. Bigwig returned to the hangar with the news that Kihar had set out. The gull was away several days, longer than the rabbits had expected. Hazel could not help wondering whether he really would return, for he knew that Kihar, like themselves, felt the mating urge and he thought it quite likely that after all he would be off to the big water and the raucous teeming gull colonies of which he'd spoken with such feeling to Bigwig. As far as he was able, he kept his anxiety to himself. But one day, when they were alone, he asked Fiverr whether he thought Kehar would return. "'He will return,' said Fiverr, unhesitatingly. "'And, and what will he bring with him?' Well, "'How can I tell?' replied Fiverr. But later, when they were underground, silent and drowsy, he said suddenly, The gifts of Elifleur are trickery, great danger, and blessing for the Warren. When Hazel questioned him again, he seemed to be unaware that he'd spoken, and could add nothing more. Bigwig spent most of the hours of daylight watching for Kahar's return. He was inclined to be surly and short, and once, when Bluebell remarked that he thought Meester Pigvig's fur cap was molting in sympathy for absent friends, he showed a flash of his old Sergeant Major spirit, and cuffed and abused him twice round the honeycomb until Holly intervened to save his faithful jester from further trouble. It was late one afternoon, with a light north wind blowing and the smell of hay drifting from the fields of Sidmonton, when Bigwig came hurtling down into the honeycomb to announce that Kehar was back. Hazel suppressed his excitement and told everyone to keep out of the way while he went to see him, alone. On second thoughts, however, he took Fiverr and Bigwig with him. The three of them found Kihar back in his lobby. It was full of droppings, messy and malodorous. Rabbits will not excrete underground, and Kihar's habit of fouling his own nest had always disgusted Hazel. Now, in his eagerness to hear his news, the guano smell seemed almost welcome. "'Glad to see you back, Kahar," he said. "'Are you tired?' "'Ving, he still go tired. "'Fly little bit, stop little bit, everything go fine.' "'Are you hungry? Shall we get you some insects?' "'Fine, fine, good fellas, plenty beetle.' "'All insects were beetle to Kahar. "'Clearly he had missed their attentions and was ready to enjoy being back. "'Although he no longer needed to have food brought to the lobby, "'he evidently felt that he deserved it.' Bigwig went to get his foragers, and Gihar kept them busy until sunset. At last, he looked shrewdly at Fiverr and said, "'Eh, hey, Mr. Little One, you know what I bring, yeah?' "'I've no idea,' replied Fiverr rather shortly. "'Then I tell all this pig eel. I go along him, this way, that way, the sun come up, the sun go down. He's no rabbits, he's nothings, nothings.' He stopped. Hazel looked at Fiverr apprehensively. Then I go down. I go down in bottom. His farm with big trees all around on little hill, you know? No, we don't know it, but go on. I'll show he's not far. You see him. And here 
ease rabbits. The ease rabbits live in box, live with men, you know? Uh, they live with men, did you say? Live with men. Yeah, yeah, live with men. In shed, rabbits live in box, in shed. Men bring food, you know? I know this happens, said Hazel, I've heard of it. That's fine, Kahar, you've been very thorough, but it can't help us, can it? I think his mother's in pig box, but Elsie's no rabbits, not in fields, not in woods, no rabbits. Anyways, I no see him. Oh, that sounds bad. Wait, I tell you more. Now you hear. I go flying all the way where sun go in the middle of the day. You know this way there's a pig water? Did you go to the big water then? Asked Bigwig. Uh, no, 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 not near so far, but out this way is river, you know? No, we haven't been so far. Is river, repeated Kehar, and here is town of rabbits. On the other side of the river? No, nah, no, nah. you go that way, is pig fields all the way, then after long ways come to town of rabbits, very big, and after that is iron road and then river. Iron Road? asked Fiver. Yeah, yeah, Iron Road. You not seen him, Iron Road? Men make him. Gehar's speech was so outlandish and distorted at the best of times that it was only too common for the rabbits to be unsure what he meant. The vernacular words which he used now for Iron and Road, familiar enough to seagulls, his listeners had scarcely ever heard. Gehar was quick to impatience and now, as often, they felt at a disadvantage in the face of his familiarity with a wider world than their own. Hazel thought quickly. Two things were clear. Kehar had evidently found a big warren some way off to the south, and whatever the iron road was, the warren was on this side both of it and of a river. If he had understood rightly, it seemed to follow that the iron road and the river could be ignored for their purposes. Kehar, he said, I want to be certain. Can we get to the rabbit's town without bothering about the iron road and the river? Yeah, yeah. Not go to iron road. Rabbit town in bushes for pig lonely fields. Plenty mothers. How long would it take to go from here to the, to the town? I think two days. Is long way. Oh, good for you, Kaha. You've done everything we hoped. You rest now. We'll feed you as long as you want. Sleep now. Tomorrow, plenty beetle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rabbits made their way back to the honeycomb. Hazel told Kahar's news, and a long, disorderly, intermittent discussion began. This was their way of reaching a conclusion. The fact that there was a warren two or three days' journey to the south flickered and oscillated down among them as a penny wavers down through deep water, moving one way and the other, shifting, vanishing, reappearing, but always sinking towards the firm bottom. Hazel let the talk run on as long as it would, until at last they dispersed and slept. The next morning they went about their lives as usual, feeding Kihar and themselves, playing and digging. But all this time, just as a drop of water slowly swells until it's heavy enough to fall from a twig, the idea of what they meant to do was becoming clear and unanimous. By the following day Hazel saw it plain. It so happened that the time for speaking came when he was sitting on the bank at sunrise with Fiver and three or four others. There was no need to summon a general gathering. The thing was settled. When it reached them, those who were not there would accept what he had said without having heard him at all. This warren that Kahar found, said Hazel, he said it was big. So we can't take it by force, said Bigwig. I don't think I want to go and join it, said Hazel, do you? And leave here, replied Dandelion, after all our work. Besides, I reckon we'd have a thin time. No, I'm sure none of us wants to do that. What we want is to get some does and bring them back here, said Hazel. Will that be difficult, do you think? I should have thought not, said Holly. Big warrens are often overcrowded and some of the rabbits can't get enough to eat. The young does get edgy and nervous and some of them don't have any kittens on that account. At least the kittens begin to grow inside them, and then they melt away again inside their bodies. You know this? I didn't know, said Strawberry. That's because you've never been overcrowded. But our warren, the Three Arras warren, was overcrowded a year or two back, and a lot of the younger does were reabsorbing their litters before they were born. The Three Arras told me long ago that Elefrera made a bargain with Frith. Frith promised him that rabbits were not to be born dead or unwanted. 
If there's a little chance of a decent life for them, it's a doe's privilege to take them back into her body, unborn. Yes, I remember the bargain story, said Hazel. So you think there may be discontented does? That's hopeful. We are agreed, then, that we ought to send an expedition to this warren, and there's a good chance of being successful without fighting. Do you want everyone to go? I'd say not, said Blackberry. Two or three days' journey, and we're all in danger, both going and coming. It would be less dangerous for three or four rabbits than for Hrere. Three or four can travel quickly, and aren't conspicuous, and the chief rabbit of this warren would be less likely to object to a few strangers coming with a civil request. I'm sure that's right, said Hazel. We'll send four rabbits, and they can explain how we come to be in this difficulty, and ask to be allowed to persuade some does to come back with them. I don't see that any chief rabbit can object to that. I wonder which of us would be the best to send. Hazel Ra, you mustn't go, said Dandelion. You're needed here, and we don't want to risk you. Everyone's agreed on that. Hazel had known already that they would not let him lead the embassy. It was a disappointment, but nevertheless he felt that they were right. The other Warren would have little opinion of a chief rabbit who ran his own errands. Besides, he was not particularly impressive in appearance, or as a speaker. This was a job for someone else. All right, he said. I knew you wouldn't let me go. I'm not the right fellow anyway. Holly is. He knows everything about moving in the open, and he'll be able to talk well when he gets there. No one contradicted this. Holly was the obvious choice. But to select his companions was less easy. Everyone was ready to go, but the business was so important that at last they considered each rabbit in turn, discussing who would be the most likely to survive the long journey, to arrive in good shape, and to go down well in a strange warren. Bigwig, rejected on the grounds that he might quarrel in strange company, was inclined to be sulky at first, but came round when he remembered that he could go on looking after Kihar. Holly himself wanted to take Bluebell, but, as Blackberry said, one funny joke at the expense of the chief rabbit might ruin everything. Finally they chose Silver, Buckthorn and Strawberry. Strawberry said little, but was obviously very much pleased. He had suffered a good deal to show that he was no coward, and now he had the satisfaction of knowing that he was worth something to his new friends. They started early in the morning in the grey light. Kihar had undertaken to fly out later in the day to make sure they were going in the right direction and bring back news of their progress. Hazel and Bigwig went with them to the southern end of the hangar and watched as they slipped away, heading to the west of the distant farm. Holly seemed confident, and the other three were in high spirits. Soon they were lost to sight in the grass, and Hazel and Bigwig turned back into the wood. "'Well, we've done the best we can,' said Hazel. "'The rest's up to them and to Elefrera now. "'But surely it ought to be all right.' "'Not a doubt of it,' said Bigwig. "'Let's hope they're back soon.' I'm looking forward to a nice doe and a litter of kittens in my burrow. Lots of little bigwigs, Hazel, think of that, and tremble. <laughs>